So there's this interesting moment in 2004 where you're you're holed up in a, in a cabin in Monterey and you're writing a pe- paper oh. called <laughs> Why the Democrats Keep Nominating Stiffs. Yeah. And <laughs> with John Kerry obviously being a case study in that. Yeah. And, uh, and you, you're listening, you don't get TV, so you're listening on the radio and uh, Barack Obama comes on. Yeah. And you've been trying to get Democrats to tell a story, right? A broader narrative yeah. Yeah. of what they're for, not just talk in terms of white papers and policies, because that's not getting through to the American people. And you hear Obama, and right, it was like, uh, it was like you said, it was like a holy shit moment, right? <laughs> that you're like, and, yeah, holy and shit then, moment. and then at that point, did you know that he had a community organizing background at that point, or did no. you later learn about no, that? No, later. No. Was that surprising to you? Um, Most candidates don't have that background. Yeah, I, I don't know that it was that consequential, frankly. I, I think that, um, I think his. Um, there's a very, in, in Remick's book, right? we're not supposed to talk about other books. No, that's a great book. In the bridge, the, yeah. the <laughs> chapter, chapter six, the chapter on, on uh, Obama's writing right, yeah. is, a, is a really great chapter because he puts Obama in the tra- Obama's writing in the tradition of African-American narratives and going back to the 19th century, the slave narratives and Frederick Douglass and the whole work of identity construction. Uh, and I thought that was really helpful. I, uh, you know... Because it's sort of like, you know, you're this or you're that or what are you and where are you? You've got a lot of work you have to do. And so <coughs> learning to tell your story uh, is not some sort of incidental or accidental thing, but actually a, a major part <coughs> of, of what you have to do. And so Dreams from My Father, I think, was, you know, an exercise in that. And so what I heard on that speech was someone who got that, um, that values matter, that the language of values is is emotion, that values are communicated emotionally, that values about action are communicated through narrative, uh, that story is the way in which we learn to access the sources of value that motivate us to confront uncertainty with courage and with hope. And and that's what I heard. And I hadn't heard that from a Democrat, but everybody was talking about po- lockboxes and stuff. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> missing the whole point that yeah. what motivates people is 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 not these wonkery things. It's the heart. It's the and and Democrats have become so alienated from the heart for a whole lot of reasons. Mm-hmm. So that I heard that I said, hmm, this has got the potential. Yeah, and then what I think it was was really interesting is then you get involved in the campaign and you start doing these Camp Obamas. Yeah, and I think people only start belatedly paying attention to them, but. You start getting people to tell their who are inspired by Obama to start analyzing what he's saying and start telling their own stories. Right. And you start trying to create a bench of basically mini Obamas, right? People to go out and really run the campaign yeah. before the campaign, because the campaign's really only existing in the early stages in four That's places. True. So if you're not in there, what are you doing? And so the question is how to build out the campaign. So you start doing them in California, yeah. and they start doing them in, you know. One, another young orange that starts doing them in Idaho and they start spreading in different places. Well, the key, it's interesting because the, all the focus was in four states where they had their staff. There were volunteers clamoring to get involved in the campaign all over the place and it was just being ignored. Uh, Buffy Wicks, uh, uh, who was another young organizer, actually young she'd, worked, organizer. she'd worked for Dean in Iowa and had sort of led a rebellion against the, <laughs> the way the campaign was working. Uh, Buffy was then working in the headquarters and was going crazy about the fact that all these people were not being offered anything to do. She organized the first volunteer canvas day. She got uh, Temu Figueroa, who was the, <coughs> the field director at the time, to do that. But then there was this pressure coming from California and elsewhere saying, we're funding this campaign. We're not seeing any action here. So that's when they decided, oh, well, let's see what we can do on the road. And that's when I was asked to put together the, the, those Camp Obamas starting in California uh, in in the summer of 2007, and working with Buffy. And what we did there was basically take a model of leadership development organizing that I developed working with some colleagues in the Sierra Club project <coughs> of developing leadership teams, which was new to electoral stuff. Usually it's individual. And grounding it in shared <laughs> values, which was like the narrative work. And so people would come thinking that they were supposed to learn Obama's story or else learn a set of policy issues, you know, like the position on 53 things. We said, no, the first thing we're going to help you learn is how to articulate what's moved you to to come here and to get involved. And that was learning how to tell their, what we call their public narrative, their story itself, why they were called to do that, bridge it to a story of us, what, what the values are that we share, 
and link it to a story of now, which is what's the challenge calling us to act now. Yeah. Now, Obama does this in the first seven minutes of that Democratic Convention speech. So we would use that and then debrief that. <coughs> and then, as you say, uh, people were learning how to do what Obama does. Yeah. I mean, not, not tell Obama's story, but, but learn to do what he does. And if people were able then to, to build the campaign um, in a way that as the primary churned on and on and on, became very powerful because Obama could swoop into a state and he could already have a full organization there. You know, like I talk about Idaho, for example. You know, and the thing, I mean, these people in Idaho, you know, they're, they're doing Camp Obama, in, uh, you know, in August 2007 when no one believes the primary may even go to Idaho. And so, lo and behold, you know, by the time, um, you know, Obama makes to Idaho, a, you know, a few days before the February 5th primary, I mean, he, you know, they've joined up such an organization that, you know, he gets 15,000 people to pack, um, it was like a tenth of the state's uh, <laughs> electorate or something like that, um, in, uh, in, um, in the primary, and then he starts to build this grassroots army that not only does he have all these people, but he has people who actually train and can organize. And as you say, you know, the campaign becomes an organizing school, yeah. right? Um, so. But you don't, so you don't think that Obama's um, background as a community organizer led to some of this stuff? I really don't, because I think that, I mean, his experience of community organizing was in a pretty, very orthodox um, version of Alinsky community organizing in Chicago. And actually, I think he found it very frustrating. I think that's why he left. I think he felt uh, how limited it was and how sort of... Uh, but I also think that he was uncomfortable with the adversarial character of it. And the kind of organizing we did in the campaign was movement-building organizing, which is really quite different. It's, it's much more um, uh, visionary. It's much more high commitment. It's much more high risk. Uh, and the reason I say that is that, uh, that from the top, there, the strategy didn't come from the top. Yeah. I mean, you know, they persisted in this crazy uh, strategy in New Hampshire that was the antithesis of organizing. Uh, and, you know, and just wouldn't, they wouldn't listen to anything. And then mm -hmm. they went down the tubes there in yeah. New Hampshire. So, on the other hand, I think that clearly his experience attuned him to see what was going yeah. on. <clears throat> Uh, and, uh, and you know, saw that there was something extraordinary happening. Yeah. And, of course, he was making it happen yeah. in large part. 